All right, once again, this is Chris Thede, Managing Editor of Comarc Magazine, and I'm here with David Swartz and Pete Basevice from HLW. Um, before we get started, I wonder if each of you could give just a quick introduction to yourselves and, and your roles and what you do. Yes, my, hi, I'm David Swartz. I'm a senior partner with HLW. I've actually been with the company for 25 years, and I am responsible for the delivery aspect of our work, really the sort of the technical product. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and hi, my name is Pete Basevice. I'm uh, direct, I'm director of research for HLW. Uh, I've been with the firm now for about six and a half years. Um, I'm also a research associate at the University of Michigan uh, Business School. Uh, my work primarily focuses on the uh, strategy side of, of projects and, and overseeing initiatives like this one that we're here to talk about today. Okay. Great. Well, thank you both for taking some time to uh, be with us here today. We appreciate it. And so we're here to talk about uh, a project that um, that HLO, HLW has developed called Project Hero. Um, talk a little bit about that, I guess, describe the concept, uh, kind of give us the, the 30,000 foot view of, of what it is and uh, you know, what are the key elements? I mean, I think one of the things I like to talk about really is the story of why we're doing it. I think once you understand mm -hmm. why, then it's very easy to understand what the project's about. So one of the things that I saw is I saw all these studies really being done by HLW in really a variety of different firms in our current COVID crisis. And so saw that really all of our responses, everything that we're doing right now, puts us in this defensive position to a pandemic that's already here. You can see that we were already over 10 million cases uh, this week. You know, our, but we also found that all these studies we we're looking at from other architects, including ourselves, were worthwhile, but they didn't really look at, in an, it, look at it in a different way. So the question that we sort of posed to ourselves, what if we were able to stop the virus at its source and create a solution that didn't place us in really in a position of a victim but in a position to really control our future and to really have some impact in saving our way of life. Wouldn't that be a direction we'd want to seek? So with Project Hero, what it is, it's a proactive solution that goes to the source of where a virus or a future pandemic might happen and actually bringing a lar very, very large program to that specific location with the best uh, doctors and the best facility in the world to be able to really arrest it immediately so that we don't have a future pandemic. Really, the goal is to safeguard our future. So is it uh, basically like a mobile kind of uh, uh, medical unit or a mobile uh, hospital research facility, that kind of thing that can be deployed? We sort uh, of compared it almost to like a mobile city. In other words, we're bringing okay. not only a hospital component in the housing of patients, but we're also housing staff. And we're also creating amenities for staff too, as well as maintenance, security, and everything that would be needed to run this thing on its own. So we have a series of six building types and each building type really is independent of each other. So it can get either larger or smaller depending on the needs. So our initial thought was we would almost be bringing over 2 million square feet of program to a virus location. And with potentially having the best people in the world uh, occupying this, like I had said. Okay. And so um, what, are the, what are the key, I guess, the key elements? I mean, you started to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the different building types. I guess if you could go into a little bit more detail about, uh, about what those are and, uh, and then how this would be, I guess, developed or deployed potentially. I mean, the key elements that make up the project, there are six building types. Actually, we almost say seven too. There's the hospital building itself. There's the patient housing, housing building, staff housing. And then we have a building called wellness, which houses the commissary offices, fitness, conference, and learning. We have a support building that deals with the de decontamination, storage, security, and maintenance for really the people that work the facility. Uh, and we also have a small building called triage building that we looked at locating throughout an entire city. 
that would where patients would actually go to be assessed before they would be brought into the hospital itself. Okay. And, I'm sorry, you're going to, you're. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I, I thought you were continuing there. No, I, I mean, okay. I, I was sort of describing definitely the building types themselves. Sure, sure. So um, you, you mentioned, you know, why this, uh, this idea kind of came to, to you. I guess talk a little bit about the process in terms of, um, you know, developing this idea, how it, uh, how it occurred to the, to the people at HLW, who all was involved, and what, tell me the story of kind of how it uh, sort of uh, came to be. Well, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I didn't like this phrase, the new normal, and felt that sort of our cities and our existence really isn't based on social distancing. I felt everything that we were proposing in today's world was going against the way we currently live and the really going against our cities actually surviving. I mean, are we going to take our stadiums and our subways and our theaters and everything that relates to a city and just say this is no longer valid in our new world. So our real goal was what can we do to bring us back to normal. That was really what the question was and why we started to develop it. I came up with this idea because I saw what other architects were doing and I saw what we were doing and I say there's got to be a better way to look at this. Why we're in a victim's position solving the problems. We're not in a proactive position trying to assess what we can do to safeguard our future. You know, you look currently, we have a COVID committee being set up by President-elect Biden. And you look at that and say, well, they're going to look at our current crisis and how to solve it. So COVID essentially goes away. It isn't the problem that we're seeing today. But what are we doing to safeguard our future? That's really what Project Hero thought about. And that's what we were you know, that's what, why we think it's valid and it's important because we're not looking at a solution to make this not happen again. Yeah, I would also add that, you know, as a firm, we have a, a firm-wide R&D initiative. And, you know, we, this idea that David's describing was really something that we, as, as, a, as a group within the firm, really, were really interested in for a number of reasons. Obviously, the the implications for uh, for addressing the current and 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 really the future crisis is, is obviously really important. But you know, in terms of architecture, you know, a crisis is really a great time. To, this is a time where innovation happens. You know, we're seeing a lot of disruption in to our cities. You know, we're seeing building projects going on hold. We're seeing um, you know offices uh, emptying out, and you know, we're seeing cities being taken over by mobile hospitals that we you know early on in the pandemic and so as as an architecture firm that is really trying to think about the bigger picture and trying to think about you know how do we um, how do we bring research uh, into the design process so that we're not only learning from it but we're also it's also driving innovation in our practice you know this type of a project and this type of a uh, you know really the, the questions that we were asking and the, you know, potential solutions that we were beginning to think through really helped uh, frame this, this, uh, this project. So, yeah, so talk a little bit about that research in terms of, you know, what were your, uh, what were you looking for? What was your, uh, what were your findings that kind of led you to the, the development of this, of this project? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we're, you know, this was driven by the immediate crisis, but when we took a step back and we look, looked a little bit more broadly at, you know, what really is the mobile hospital typology? You know, this is not the first mobile hospital or, you know, the idea of bringing healthcare to the, you know, in to the field. You know, you know, we sort of looked at that typology. You know, there's lots of different ways that that has been implemented through, you know, land-based, you know, tent hospitals and, um, you know, trailers that get set up to, you know, um, you know, um, airborne hospitals, to, you know, to ships, you know, we saw the big naval ships that were coming into, you know, New York City and how that's another typology. But what we realized is that we really did not see a full, a fully systemic uh, solution that could really go anywhere. And so, you know, to, to David's point, being able to go to ground zero. And when we thought about it, you know, this is not just about preventing a virus this is, you know there's you know these types of mobile solutions are brought to 
uh, disaster zones. And what we also learned is that as, as much as there have been innovations in mobile healthcare design, you know, a lot of this sort of lives and breathes in the moment when there's a crisis and when the crisis ends, you know, the innovation seems to stop. And so, you know, you could look at the history of, say, for example, civil defense architecture and how for a number of decades, you know, we invested in, um, in uh, architecture that could, you know, protect us in the event of, you know, nuclear war, you know, during the Cold War. You know, we all know about the fallout shelters in cities. So what happened to all that, in, to all that infrastructure now? You know, some of it is decaying. Some of it's been repurposed. And what we've been learning is that the, the, the knowledge and skills are very perishable. And so, you know, the idea of, of creating really a whole system that is um, adaptable, scalable to, you know, any level of healthcare need, whether it's filling a gap um, or addressing, uh, you know, a major crisis really, um, you know, again, also uh, influenced us. You know, there's statistics from the World Health Organization. Um, you know, uh, countries that um, countries that simply don't have access to, you know, clean water or um, or not even having hand washing facilities in a pandemic. You know, the basic advice of like wash your hands is not possible in certain parts of the world. But even looking at our own country, the New York Times wrote about earlier this spring. You know, to look at the geography of our own country you know, half the country, people live in areas where a emergency room is more than 30 minutes away. So how do you design a, a flexible, adaptable mobile healthcare system that can be, you know, brought to those communities, you know, either on a temporary or even like to a semi-permanent basis? So uh, talk a little bit about um, how this, uh, something like uh, Project Hero would be deployed. I mean, would it, uh, um, obviously it would be, uh, you said it would be scalable. Um, I guess, how would it be kind of brought to bear in, in an area where, where it, was, it is needed? Well, I think what we did is we actually put together, we did a pretty extensive study. It's about a 121 page report okay. and we talk about the deployment. So what we did is we set up a series that we created locations in various cities throughout the world where large warehouse structures would be located where the units themselves would be stored. So the specific modules that we created are in our mind, intelligent modules that can be hooked up and fully diagnosed when you're actually erecting and putting them together, they're done in more of a electronic means. In other words, they can attach almost automatically together. So we sort of developed a system that we believe works in attacking pipes and conduits uh, specifically together as well, as well as attaching the modules themselves together. So picture a large series of these modules stored throughout the entire world um, and then being deployed to a specific location based on how close it is to that warehouse. So we talked about a two or three day driving distance. We also talked about having container ships available to have these modules on them, but the modules would actually be on the container ship all the time. So they wouldn't be loaded on and then loaded off because the amount of time to do that actually is quite cumbersome. We had a transportation consultant that looked at it and said, you know, this is possible especially by truck or by train. And specifically, if we're using container ships, that's sort of as a supplement to augment a specific location. So that's how we thought. So we had this whole scenario where we looked also at both at urban, suburban, and rural conditions, how would it work specifically there. And what it is, is Project Hero actually sets up in city streets so that we don't really have foundations. We have this leveling platform that we put in place that's actually jacked into place and creates a level platform that you'd basically stack the units on top of each other. So our goal really was to be able to build almost, uh, I would say it was close to a million square feet in one week and two million square feet in two weeks and actually be able to build larger or smaller based on the need. You know, if we bring in from different warehouse areas, the thing can get up to maybe uh, 
five or six or 10 million square feet, or it could get as small as it need, needs to. It could also come down as the virus gets better and better within that area. So that was really what we looked at. So we did a lot of research on speed and the ability to be able to transport it to specific locations and sort of make this sort of make this idea really a reality. And what was the time frame in terms of, you know, when uh, the idea, I guess, was first, when you first thought of it, I mean, how long, what was this process like in terms of kind of developing this concept? From beginning when, COVID, when COVID hit us, I saw that our office was doing a lot of studies. And then I was thinking about, you know, there's got to be a better way. How can architecture really affect um, our future? What kind of impact can it particularly have in solving a problem like this? I know we obviously know that we're not doctors. We're not the people that are going to occupy the space, but we're the ones that create the space. And what can we do to make something that would attract talent? So I, as I thought about it, I said, there, it's got to be a proactive solution, but it can't be for our current crisis because our current crisis, everything we do is going to be defensive. So what do we do at the next? And then the more research that I did, I realized just very clearly that we needed to go to ground zero and every week early, you know, the earlier we could get to a ground zero location, the better chance that we specifically have of stemming a virus at its source and stopping a future pandemic to safeguard our future. And I was just, is this possible? And actually I said on the board of governors at USC and said, why don't I see if I can get the school of architecture and the school of medicine together to work with us on that. And that's essentially what happened. We were able to bring uh, six full-time students to work with us through the whole project, which was about a seven week long process. And we were able to raise about, about $55,000 dollars to pay the students to work uh, with us. We also had about up to 20 people at HLW and we had about 35 consultants on board. I mean, we had a tremendous amount of consultants all working for free and actually all donating money for this specific project because we all thought it was a good idea and then in our industry felt the proactive solution was a really good way to look at our current crisis. So yeah, that's interesting. You, um, you mentioned the, I guess, the idea of, or I'm sorry, the, the role of architects and kind of taking the lead in something like this. I guess talk a little bit about that in terms of, um, as it relates to this project, but even just kind of in general, in terms of why is it important for architects to kind of uh, step up and, and take the lead in, in playing a greater role in solving some, some of the world's most challenging problems, You know, maybe some of which we don't even know what they are yet, but certainly, uh, we've gotten a pretty good glimpse of, you know, what a, a pandemic is like um, and how the, 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 um, the Project Hero concept also works for things like famine and, and so forth. I guess talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of the architect in, in this type of situation. Well, I always felt, I mean, as an architect, I've always felt that the built environment represents a tremendous amount of our world. I mean, it's it's the icon of all major cities, right? You know, look at a city, the land geography as being representative of the city in most cases. You look at the buildings themselves, iconic buildings. So architecture has a tremendous impact. And I think as architects, we have to look at ourselves as citizen architects. This is something that uh, Dean Curry always promotes very heavily at USC, this concept of citizen architect, where you go out and become much more than just the architect in your company. You look at really trying to uh, help our world in, in a way that we can. And I thought this was just such a good opportunity for us to really look at this thing differently and maybe potentially have an impact in saving our future world. If we can say Project Hero was fully implemented, got implemented, actually worked and went to a virus location and stemmed it at its source and we didn't have a pandemic, could we say this project saved a million lives, you know, or saved a uh, or half a million lives. I think that's just really a wonderful feeling to be able to think that architecture could be the impetus to be able to do something like that. And that's sort of what got me interested. I said, this is one of the few times where architecture can have a large impact. And wouldn't it be wonderful if our profession actually was a solution to our next potential pandemic that we created the solution? Um, 
I would also add on to that. Um, you know, I come from a um, background in the social sciences, you know, having worked in architecture now for almost a decade, but coming out of, you know, social science research and applying it to the to architecture and the built built environment, one of the things that, you know, I've seen and I've learned over the years is, is how important architecture and and the built environment is for, you know, for example, helping, you know, individuals, organizations, communities uh, express who they are. You know, it's, it's a way of, of expressing um, identity. You know, you see uh, iconic architecture and it, you know, helps you identify with the city. And, you know, what we were seeing in the, you know, early in the, pan in the pandemic in our major cities, you know, we're, uh, you know, the crisis necessitated, you know, sort of the streets being filled with, again, you know, mobile hospital facilities and, and other, you know, other very, very poignant visual reminders of the crisis that we were in. And, you know, it's a reaction to a need, but, you know, again, when you sort of think about it from different perspectives, you realize how architecture can be part of the healing process, you know, through the really through the really thoughtful connections between, you know, the environment that people are in and how that affects their, you know, their well-being. You know, we think of that in a very proactive way when we're thinking about like, you know, office design or we're designing learning environments. But when you're dealing with a crisis and, and you realize that, that, that people, um, you know, that, that design can also affect the processes that, that initiate healing, you know, that is really powerful but you have to realize that it's a very, that it's an interdisciplinary conversation. I mean, we can be part of the conversation. We can bring these, these ideas, but you know, what I've learned is the importance of, of working across disciplines. And so again, this is why we partnered with USC. This is why we had, you know, medical experts on, on this team who were by, you know, who are the ones that have to work in these facilities and to share with us their perspective. Um, on what makes an effective design, because, you know, we also want this to be a learning environment for these physicians. You, know, you think about how, you know, you're coming in and you're dealing with a crisis and you have to learn in real time. And so that, re so that means like reviewing cases at the end of a shift and having space for, you know, healthcare practitioners to share information, you know, so even thinking of this as a, as a learning environment, you know, that comes from having, you know, those conversations across boundaries. And so, you know, as our, you know, architecture can't do all of it, but we can be a part of a much bigger conversation and really understanding how the built environment plays, plays a role. Um, well, I mean, we wanted, and, we really wanted Project yeah. Hero to be a nice place. I mean, a place that we would be able to attract the best talent in the world, the best doctors in the world to want to be part of a program and feel like this is a place that I'm going that's going to treat me well, that I'm going to have a nice place to live, of food, the right support, the best equipment, the best resources. So without being able to attract the talent, the program really doesn't work. So the architecture has to respond to that. We also wanted to give dignity to people that are actually having our sick so that they felt like they're in a really nice facility and it didn't feel like it was a tent or it didn't feel like it was a temporary facility. It really felt like you were in a building that was equivalent in some ways nicer than a hospital. So that was also our goal in realizing that that was the only way that something like this could work. Because it was interesting when I spoke to the Dean of the School of Medicine, Loris Mosquita, she said, well, if you bring the say into Los Angeles, this is going to be competition potentially for hospitals. And I'm saying we're not looking at it in that way. I said our goal with the project is to attract the best talent. So if you know the best talent to be able to handle the next virus is all ready and willing to go to any specific city in the world and they're coming to your city to help you, this facility is very valuable and very useful. And also your hospital can be used for other things where you aren't spreading the virus. So the process, the, uh, this project also dealt with contract tracing too. So we're not only dealing with healing and helping the virus, but we're bringing contact tracers so that people can come in and bring in the best, best research in the world to be able to trace people that have the virus and to stem it really at its source. 
So it's a very holistic approach and it was fairly complicated with all the different consultants we had on board and the report we ended up doing was about 120 pages long and had a, an awful lot of information that I think that was uh, talked about a lot of these different issues that were brought up because everyone brought problems to the you know to this what we were trying to propose right mm -hmm. so we had to try to come up with ways to solve them. So I guess to, to kind of wrap up here a little bit I guess talk a little bit about um, that that process in terms of you know bringing all of these people together experts from different fields and so forth and um, I mean was it a, was it a, a kind of a gratifying or fulfilling uh, process for you as architects to kind of lead this charge in, in solving something that's you know really really important for the world I think what amazed me was really that the enthusiasm of the entire team I mean the students were absolutely fantastic because of the pandemic none of the students had summer jobs mm -hmm. so we were able to give six students summer jobs and we got the best and brightest students these students were fabulous extremely hardworking, energetic and they sort of raised you know created a, brought a lot of energy to the team and all the other consultants too i think had a lot of energy and enthusiasm to be able to make this work so in some way it was almost like a utopian studio where we were looking at something that was really to help humanity and everyone wanted to work hard to create solutions so i was almost amazed i think it turned out i would say more than twice as good as i anticipated i think we raised more than twice as much money as we thought we could and we got more than twice as many people involved as we thought in fact, we were able to bring another student on and even keep them on another two more weeks. So it ended up being a lot better than we had thought and the resources HLW brought to bear were very generous. Originally, we were just gonna put four of us on and ended up having 20, almost 20 people at its height. Wow. So as a result, I think we were able to put together yeah. a really extensive report. Yeah, I would add too that, you know, part of the success there also, you know, besides having the team was that we, yeah, this is because it was such an ambitious undertaking. We really had to sort of frame the challenge in a in a clear way. So you know, before we before we got into you know the design itself, I mean, we produced renderings, and it was very you know the end result is a very thorough design. Um, but in order to frame that, you know, we had to do you know take the team through you know some thought starter exercises. You know, we did some background reviews of the literature, you know, to know, again, a little bit more about this typology and, and, you know, what some of the design precedents are, but also define, you know, where some of the gaps were that we could fill. And then, you know, um, had a number of, of initial interviews with, you know, the medical team and really, to, and then coming up with the program, you know, the space program for a hospital. Um, and then once we once we had that, then it was okay. Let's let's you know develop the concepts and you know develop some of the um, you know the the, um, uh, the technical requirements for some of these systems that David's talking about the leveling and you know how do we actually you know how high can we build these things you know so you know we really started broad, you know broad but but put some parameters around it and then carried it through the rest of the um, stages of design. Great. So, so what's next? What's what's the next uh, what's next for Project Hero and for HLW? Well, I mean, our real goal is to do a proof of concept. We want to be able to build some of these modules to show how they actually go together with the speed that we're talking about to prove that we can electronically attach things. Um, that's one of the aspects as well as what if what is what does this actually look like mm -hmm. so we've actually put together a budget for be able being able to do that and we're looking at uh, some potential investors hopefully to be able to make this happen we've i think the project's been published about eight times i think it's been talked about just recently won an award yesterday which is fantastic so we're trying to get the word out about this project we're hopefully looking to get the Biden administration involved in looking at what we're doing. We're trying to contact them now and, and see if we can have them look at, specifically look at this project and see how we can help uh, protect our future. 
and we know we're looking at our current crisis, but I think it might be good for them to sort of see what kind of things are being looked at to help us in the future. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your time here today. It's our, it's our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it.